And I want him to uh, really feel this. So, would everybody please, if you please, uh, stand up now, please. And let's give a great round of applause to the wonderful Wayne Shorter. Uh, Fred has something he wants to tell us about jazz and Chicago's history of jazz. And Okay. Well, we'll see how this works out. Because when you were introducing me, I was thinking you forgot to say clown extraordinaire. But at any rate, um, I have a project in mind. I'm wondering if we might end up working on it together. Even That's why I asked you if you traveled. Um, basically, I guess the roots of it goes back to my desire to kind of highlight my connection to my mother's brother, his name was McKee Fitzhugh, and he was a very prominent uh, Chicago um, jazz club owner. Uh, the uh, venue was called McKee's, and uh, or actually the more formal name of the place was M McKee's Disc Jockey Show Lounge. McKee's, McKee's M-C-K-I-E-S. Though many people in uh, familiarity misspell it m-c-k-e-y-s he was also uh, a very well-known uh, dj on uh, a radio station called wvon wvon in chicago yeah and there was a cadre of djs that were well known they were called the wvon good guys you know what, that, what type of music was it it was all uh, R and B. R and B, okay. But see, McKee was a jazz promoter, and, and he, he had his jazz club, you know. And uh, I don't want to go too much into that because, first of all, uh, you know, stories get scattered this way and the other when you're trying to talk about things. But uh, a, a sister of mine who's also involved in entertainment, and I have often uh, speculated or dreamed or whatever about basing anything like a sitcom or, or anything where we use the McKees as a backtrack. But we always wanted to bring in the history and the more recent history because, you know, we're babies. You know, I'm, 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 I'm really young. I'm 76. And... Uh, Doesn't look a day over 50, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. But... Um, we saw all kinds of performers there, you know, or at least I did. And there were ones that I didn't see, but John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, uh, Gene Emmons, uh, Ahmad Jamal, you know, it was- One of my favorite, the loneliest monk you mentioned. Yeah. But you know, when it was right in the middle of, a, of an area where there were a lot of jazz clubs, or not a lot, but a few jazz clubs, and they were all of, of note. And it was not far from the uh, Regal Theater. And uh, that's the uh, historic Regal Theater in Chicago. Yeah, I forget the name of the street, but it's kind of like an icon. It, it was on 47th and King Drive. It was uh, diagonally on that, uh, right across from McKee's uh, record um, shop because he also, he was quite an entrepreneur. He had a couple of record shops and we used to go and uh, he would sit up in the window and he would spin his records and he would be broadcasting on, I believe the radio station at that time was WGES and you know people would gather and watch him in the window and uh, you know, listen to the radio broadcast coming over the speakers and what have you. We would be getting in the way, and so he went to get us out of the way. So he'd tell me or one of my sisters to come here, and he'd give us a note. And the note said, "McKee's nephew and nieces." He'd say, "Take that over to the Regal Theater, which was diagonally, you know, across from from the uh, record store." And we'd go over there and we'd give, give the piece of paper to the usher and he would take us right down to the front row. 
I was so small at the time, my feet wouldn't even reach the floor. <laughs> so the stage of the Regal looked like as big as a football field. Mm -hmm. And I remember the last time I was there, it was so much pageantry because it was, um, now I'm gonna have a brain, you know, brain cramp, uh, Cab Calloway. Wow. And Lionel Hampton. And my mouth was just wide open. This little kid sitting in the front row, feet won't even hardly come past the edge of the seat. Mouth wide open, looking from one side of the stage to the other. And I'm telling my sisters, when I grow up, that's what I'm gonna do. And they're like, you ain't gonna do nothing, <laughs> you know. Well, I showed them, you know. I have to admit, I haven't done it as large as uh, as Cab Calloway or Lionel Hampton, but I do my thing. Yeah, Maybe that's do. a good place for me to stop. I don't know. No, no, it's great. Uh, I'm gonna ask you just a few more questions for clarity. Um, this neighborhood where this um, theater was. The audience was predominantly black, or was it a mixed? Chicago has kind of had a well. It, it, it as, as far as I knew, it was black. But then you now we would be going to shows in the daytime. I'm not sure what happened at night because I know Chicago does have a history of, of uh, Caucasian and I guess at Al uh, coming into the black neighborhoods for entertainment value. At, at, at nighttime, you know, even even to McKees. Mm -hmm. But um, that kind of getting me back on track there, you were asking me or I was looking to, to say something to you about an idea that I have. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna be business uh, plan, copyright agreement to review and all that. So can't nobody steal this, but it's like, uh, I want to do a multimedia educational piece and maybe uh, center at least the main back backdrop on McKee McKees or McKay's and where it, it, will, it will be fact-based, not necessarily factually accurate, you know, but it, it, the, the purpose would not be to fabricate anything, but um, we, uh, we want to tell about the, the the jazz personalities. We want to give the history of Chicago jazz, and we want to get, get get the funding and take it into the schools. You know, because our children are rapidly losing their sense of a cultural history, and now we're starting to get an assistance in that from some. I'll, I'll skip the adjectives, but from some po political arenas, shall we say. Right, right. So we want to maintain, you know, somebody just said to me this morning, and I hope this isn't too abrasive, but you can edit it out. But, uh, you know, we're here at, well, I'm not going to say where we are for another purpose, but um, was saying to me that the way that the Nazis got started and the formula that they came up with was to erase the history of the Jewish people. So then when they got rid of the Jews, nobody could prove that the Jews was ever here. And, you know, that seems to be a possible scheme in terms of the oppression and, and the depression of the African-American. No doubt, currently, racist statement to make America great again. In the last few years of uh, American society and this turn, and um, you know, you know the the the, the popular mis misstatement in uh, the African American section of Chicago <laughs> is "Make America Hate Again." Exactly. Excuse me for interrupting. You know. No, that's fine. You're fine. Um, you know, when you when you say that, what comes to mind, um, and we're here at a Soka Gak International United States Florida Nature and Culture Center for a conference of people of African descent. And that's why we're gathered here today to not only refresh in our faith, practice, and study, but to learn each other's stories, to inspire each other, to advance our cause for world peace, 
uh, based on the teaching of Nietzsche and Daishona. And we have a mentor in our life, Daisaku Ikeda, who wrote this series of books, The New Human Revolution. And in the very first chapter, or the first volume, talks about his witnessing discrimination in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, and he refreshed his own determination to eliminate the same type of inequality in America, actually worldwide. Yes. Because uh, we as people of color, black and brown, are identified and put down as soon as someone sees our face. But we're here to make a difference. And I just want to thank you, Fred, for sharing your story and taking this time out to talk to our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 